Comedian, writer, and actor Elliot Glazer joins the Road to Cinema podcast this week to discuss everything from being in the writer's room of the hit television series New Girl, acting on Broad City alongside his sister Alana Glazer, creating the viral video Shit New Yorkers Say, his musical comedy stage show Haunting Renditions, working for Anthony Bourdain's production company, and the incredible influence of David Wayne and Wet Hot American Summer on so many of the popular comedies that we see today. For more information on the Road to Cinema podcast, please visit jogroadproductions.com. Follow us on Twitter at Jog Road, Instagram at Jog Road Productions, like our Jog Road Productions Facebook page. Subscribe to Jog Road Productions on YouTube to watch some of our video interviews with Don Cheadle, Ewan McGregor, and Greta Gerwig. And don't forget to subscribe to the Road to Cinema podcast on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, and Stitcher for the latest download every week. And you can also write us a nice review on the Apple Podcast page under the Road to Cinema podcast. And now we join Elliot Glazer as he shares with us his early experiences working for Anthony Bourdain's production company. My first job was as an office PA for um, yeah the production company that makes uh, his that's made his shows for I think like now it's probably fifteen years, which is bananas, wow. insane. At that point, did you know that you wanted to write, or were you kind of open no. to just doing anything in film? Oh, I was just open. I mean, I had, I, I, I was just open. I knew that I wanted to probably be in television, um, and so this was just a great, um, you know, way in. It was a boutique company. You know, it's a boutique company, um, and I just, yeah, I really didn't know what I quite yet wanted to do. I mean, I knew I wanted to do comedy, so I was doing that at night at night and on the weekends and the owners of the company were kind enough to let me use their equipment. They always would like lend out their equipment to people who needed it. Um, and so they were, they were just great supporters and they've had me act in a pilot they did with, uh, Isaac Mizrahi. They have worked with, a, you know, they, they're, they're just these, a, a wonderful couple and they just build, They've built a career on having very thoughtful, artistic, um, reality doc programming that never, ever feels like bottom of the barrel, you know, or easy. It always feels sophisticated. It always feels, um, you know, aesthetically pleasing. And it always feels very natural. They're never very natural situations to happen. Yeah. And they've done a lot of a lot of work with food, I think, by just by coincidence, you know, I don't think they, their names are Chris and Lydia. And I don't, I don't know if I would, they would peg themselves as foodies. They've just sort of through, through Tony, they've figured a way into the, into the world of, you know, programming based around food and travel in a way that it's just really intelligent and thoughtful and, um, you know, captivating. And that's why they're as popular as they are. And they have, you know, a company that seems to just keep growing and viewers that keep growing and Emmy Awards. And they're just, you know, I think they were a great model for just a work ethic for me, at least, you know. Um, and they were kind enough to let me blossom, I think, within their walls to the place of, you know, beyond just being a PA, I kind of graduated to being a little bit of a development person for them. Um, and that was, it was all just very helpful in, in helping shape you know, what I could do skill wise and, and, you know, in terms of like technicality and then, and then apply that to my own projects. You really thought it was sort of like blending technical and creative. Very much. Yeah, very much. And I mean, even this year I shot a, uh, a sizzle reel for a show that I want to, that I'm trying to sell in the sort of the reality doc world. And so having the, you know, no reservations, format drummed out so much in my head it that was you know even though what i'm doing is a little bit more irreverent and absurdist it still kind of lives in that space and so they were so it was just a really great way to get my you know wrap my head around the the real production that goes behind shoots you know you have to kind of live it to you have to live it to understand it and at the you know at that point i was you know is witnessing it and seeing how it worked and then being and then applying it to basically you know sketch and web series and stuff like that and and uh it was really that was really helpful 
Are there certain things that you feel like you always keep in mind when you're out shooting or writing that sort of mm. go back to sort of <clears throat> some of the technical things that kind of help make something really interesting? And I mean, honestly, it's it sounds very utilitarian, but just being aware of the crew is a way to lead, I think, on a set. You know, the crew is the backbone. It's it's those people who make or break something quite often. And uh, they just deserve as much respect, I think, as the actors and the, and the producers and anybody who's above the line. Yeah. The, the, you know, and they do that on... They do that at the production company. They do that with Bourdain's shows. And, I mean, <clears throat> with, with, with that show in particular, with, with um, No Reservations, crews were going out, you know to remote parts of the world <laughs> and you know they were really kind of braving the elements <clears throat> in, a, in, in a lot of ways and so it wasn't as necessarily posh as one might think even though it's Anthony Bourdain um, how and many people are on a typical crew for a show like that I think there were about eight people um, but it was a very, it was a very you know it was also so funny too because there was room to grow in that world as a producer. And I just knew wholeheartedly, like, that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be traveling in a, in a crew like that. I wanted to be creating original content that was comedic and wasn't based in, <clears throat> you know, something as big as, as international travel. Yeah. You know? was, uh, was Shit New Yorker, say, the first sort of big project that you took on? Um, that, I'm trying to remember cr- chronologically... The first big project that I did was my friend Brent Sullivan and I. Brent's a stand-up comedian. Um, and we did a web series called It Gets Better-ish. I think it was like f- six or seven episodes. Um, and it was basically a you know situational comedy about two friends in New York, um, you know, in their 20s, sort of like f- facing that head-on. But they are also gay guys, and they don't fit into the gay community pretty much whatsoever. And so we turned that into, you know, adapted that from our real lives and made it a thinly, you know, a thinly exaggerated version of um, the frustration that we have felt together as friends who have just continually been baffled by the people we're supposed to date and have sex with and (laughs) marry you know it's it's just a comedically it's like something that we've bonded over for years now that we just can't believe some of the stuff that we have to deal with just to find a boyfriend or whatever or find a find a buddy find a sex buddy whatever and was that on youtube did that go yes yes yeah we did it on youtube we got a really nice following uh we got really great feedback and I think you know what was so, what was so deeply cathartic about it was, you know, we got some great press. We were in the New York Times. We were Out Magazine like labeled us like one of the most influential LGBT people of the year, which was really nice. But um, the most I think cathartic thing for me, and I'm not, I wouldn't speak for Brent on, or I wouldn't speak on his behalf about this, but getting feedback from people who were saying this is my, this is how i feel or this is my life or nobody talks about this character it you know it really did it was a reciprocal thing where we were making this web series to you know sort of exercise our frustration and to have people mirror it and say like yes this is valid and like oh my god i wish people i wish there was more of a spotlight on this and and it felt like you know, we were connecting with people, really, really connecting with sort of the gay outsider in a way that we hadn't been able to before a moment like this. Have you always been into sort of finding that authenticity and, and doing things that are really grounded in your own experience or experiences of mm. friends, family? No, I mean, yeah. I think it started off being like, you know, <clears throat> for me personally, I started off doing improv and seeing what that was like. Um, and I did that with my sister, Alana. We did that for several years in New York. Um, and that's how we met Abby. Uh, and sort of we created this like indie improv group.
group. And um, I mean, it sort of like unfolded from there. But we did I did improv. My sister and I had a sketch show at the UCB for several years. Um, and so I, I, I was trying everything and seeing what really stuck. But it wasn't until it gets betterish that, you know, instead of, you know, instead of being personal and trying to do just like stand up and, 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 you know, filtering my life through a stand up lens, which I felt was, which I felt and still feel is like such a hard thing to do, to do well. And I knew that I wasn't necessarily up to that challenge. And so something like it gets better was the best way to codify that and, and really use my genuine life experience and Brent's as well and and you know give that a turn it into a script um and since then yeah I, that that certainly it just feels right to just be genuine and true to myself um because that's what really does for better or worse and sometimes for worse it does translate and it does yeah. You know, it does really resonate with people. And I get, you know, that's a lesson that I've also learned from, you know, my sister. And, and you know, she, as one half of, of Broad City, has really helped, you know, I think, um, validate that that's, that is true. The more real you are, and whether or not that means, you know, being vulnerable or being authentic or having to really do some self-reflection it benefits the comedy it just does it just does have you ever been at a point where you feel like you're writing something or performing and like wow this is like way too like painful or way too vulnerable for me yeah try to like pull back in a way yeah i mean i have a i have this pilot that's um that i sold to comedy central and so we're we're in the pro i'm in the process of writing the first draft of it basically and it just sucks to it just sucks to get to those moments where you're like, I'm pulling back the curtain on this character, who is basically a, mirror, a funhouse mirror version of me, and this is really hard. It's really hard to do this, put this on paper, you know, get it out from my head, yeah. put it on paper, and then know that these the producers are going to read this, you know, the network is going to read this, and it's like a real it's a real um moment of vulnerability, but you know that it will translate. You know that doing that instead of positing, you know, a more, um, I don't know, sexy version of yourself is going to, like, be the thing, yeah. you know? Writing yourself in with vanity, I think, has a way of backfiring. And again, I'm taking, you know, I'm not a veteran or anything, but that's sort of what I've picked up on yeah. in a short amount of time. Well, it's interesting. You can sometimes tell, like, when a performer or writer is, like, being honest and other times when they're, like, trying to kind of plug it up and maybe inflate whatever I think so. is in a way. Yeah, I think it, I think it reads. Yeah. I think it reads. Jumps off the page. Jumps off the screen. And you're like, eh. I, you know, you, you, you smell a little bit of, um, you can smell it. Yeah. What, uh, what, how did Shit New Yorkers say come about? What was sort of the inspiration for that originally? Um, you know, it's so, it's so strange just to think back to that and remember that it was a very specific, you know, that moment in time, those like th years were so specific, you know? I, you know, I think back to like a, that time and it was like, videos going viral was like a novel a new thing and kind of still a novelty and it was part of like the news cycle this was like 2011 -ish? i guess so 2012 yeah. i think and it's crazy to think yeah 20 i think it was 2012 just crazy to think that like wow that was it was really a part of the news cycle whereas <laughs> going viral now is not so much a thing you know i mean some stuff breaks through here and there into the mainstream but like you know, BuzzFeed videos and broadly, or not broadly, I'm just thinking like... And now even with like YouTube celebrities yeah, and all that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different landscape. Um, and honestly, as a sort of an adult, a man in my 30s, I have no interest in that. Um, but at that point, for shit New Yorkers say, all I did was kind of read the room and notice that shit girls say, which I thought was very funny, you know, but now might be problematic. <laughs> um that that was a thing and it was a, a new kind of genre of YouTube videos of just the joke was in the quick cuts, line, 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 rhythm, line, rhythm, line, you know, 
Um, and seeing that that was a thing um, and people were doing it for sort of different pockets of ethnicity, you know, uh, this type of mother, this type of, you know, this type of person, this type of ethnicity. I hadn't seen a geographic version of that yet and knew that, okay, yeah, this is, this could be a thing like focusing on New York. I just figured in the way that people would potentially do Chicago, LA, Miami, you know, I was like, I'm going to just get on this knowing like the, the sort of metrics of the internet. And so I very, very quickly wrote this, wrote this script, you know, got a couple of friends with cameras from work um and uh this is when you were at anthony bourdain no actually no this was i don't remember where we got the we always just sort of you know in that group of in that comedy community you always know or can borrow stuff from other people it's very reciprocal and community-based so we got equipment somewhere and got a couple of friends um, to be in it, had my sister in it, you know, she was like, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Why not? You know, it was very like, oh, you know, just kind of fly by night. Let's do this quickly and bang it out and edit it quickly. Did that. I think we did it in the course of a day, not, you know, maybe like maybe six hours and put it up. And then the next morning I woke up and was like, holy shit. <laughs> it, it was cra- It was a crazy, crazy Bizarre Had you sent moment. it out to anyone, or no. someone just picked up on it? Yeah, wow, yeah, it was crazy. People were like, "It was the most like what was it? I think it was the most shared YouTube video in like New York for a day, like a day or something. Like very, very weird. Still very weird. Still yeah. strange. Yeah. No, but there was something just very honest and unique about that. Having spent I guess a lot of so. time in New York, it just yeah. picked up on something that everybody felt, everybody yeah. was thinking. But the funny thing was that I think you know I knew, I learned very quickly to like not engage with commenters or anything like that because people were saying you know people were like oh this is you know this is like a spoiled you know white person's version of New York, and that was what I was going for. Like I was purposely trying to do the sort of annoying privileged hipstery version of New York not the grizzled you know m- you know native or you know you know what i mean like yeah. i'm from i'm from long island so i'm peripherally from new york and spend all my time there and grew you know grew up going to the city all the time and um so it would put but but having been at NYU and sort of seeing the lay of the land in terms of how spoiled it is you know how spoiled you have to be to live there with a certain amount of wealth that was the version of the that that was the sort of funhouse mirror that i wanted to to uh you know reflect and people were like this isn't you know this is so off this is so not real it's like yeah, that's that's the point. The point is that it's like comedy and, and kind of satirical. Yeah, not it's commenting on that specific. Exactly, person. it's not it's not information. It's satire, um, and referential. You know, um, and then it was weird because I had friends or you know friends in the comedy community who were like, "We're gonna," you know, they they asked if we would be okay with appearing in a in a version of it called "Shit Native New Yorkers Say." And I was like, what? And they were like, yeah, we want you we want you to be in it, but to be like, we don't want to give you a line. We want you to be like there so that our characters can say, look at those fucking hipsters. <laughs> and I was like, why would I want to do, you know, like, yeah. why would I do that? So it was very, that was very bizarre as well. You know, it was like, yeah, what? <laughs> You're asking me to like be lampooned by you guys trying to kind of like, lo- you know, glob onto something I did already. It was very odd, very odd. Um, Were you thinking about doing more online videos like that, or was no, that sort of it? No, that was the one. I mean, that was it. And then I, you know, but that was helpful in me getting hired to do <clears throat> branded content, digital content. Um, so you were directing a lot of digital and branded content. So. No, I was in writing. I did like a whole web series for Above Average, which is Lauren Michaels, you know, digital leg of of Broadway video, um, and that was a sort of early breeding ground for a lot of talent. You know. Um, Paul Downs and Lucia Aniello had a web series there that they work on Broad City too. Um, it, yeah, that was. I mean, I had Kate McKinnon in one of the videos that I did. It was very, very, very like early. Like they above average has really um, evolved with the times, as I think any digital company would. But I think initially at that moment it, it was just sort of this fun 
new local breeding ground for like New York comedy, New York comedians to be given a lump sum of money to just make stuff. So I had like a web series with like six, I think, different sketches, completely different sketches. Yeah, um, yeah it was it was great. Yeah, and no, those the digital channels they they've just been investing so yes. much in creating content, just yep. launching it out there, getting it out very quickly. Exactly. Yeah, and and this was before they were, you know, I think this is before that sort of factory, you know, mentality or, you know, college humor. I think was the real factory of content. You know, they were really just making as much as they could, and that's I think where BuzzFeed is now, and BuzzFeed Video are like full screen these content places that seem to just generate con- so much content all the time um snapchat too you know but uh, at that moment yeah that was a sort of like almost like the artisanal version you know the, the 1.0 version of a content farm yeah and now facebook i think they're yeah starting content too. totally completely <laughs> yeah it's uh it's changed rapidly within you know very little time i think so I was interested in learning a little about the the improv group you were in with Abby Jacobson and, and with your sister. Yeah, so that transformed into you eventually acting on Broad City and sort of playing. Uh, yeah, yeah, Alana's yeah, brother. Yeah, um, <laughs> I dra- I dragged Alana a l- kind of not kicking and screaming, but I was like, you, we have to do imp- we have to do improv together. I think she was in, still in college at that time, and I was like, we have to do it. Like she, uh, you know, I've always thought my sister's so fucking funny. And so we did, uh, we did improv at the UCB and sort of rose through the ranks, I think, as any students were, would. But then we very tenaciously pitched them a show a little too early, I think, in our, process, in our placement <clears throat> within the program. But the artistic director seemed to really like us and gave us a spot. And we had this show going for three years. And that's how we sort of met everybody. Um, and early on... In those improv classes, a lot of people created these indie improv teams to, you know, perform around New York. And, uh, yeah, we, we, it was me and Alana and Abby and then um, a few other dudes, Tim Martin, who's an actor, um, two dudes who are uh, animators. Um, so, it was, yeah, this, it was called Secret Promise Circle. And it was, like, six of us just doing improv. And we were coached with, like, Bobby Moynihan and Adam Pally. Um so yeah, it's, it's crazy to think back on it. So do you see yourself as an actor? Do you see yourself as a writer? Is this, you sort of feel like you're sort of everything in a way? I think or? I'm yeah, I'm everything, you know. Um my you know, my manager calls calls me a multi-hyphenate, you know, <laughs> and I and my agents do the same where they can pitch me as an actor for commercials. They can pitch me as a series lead. They can pitch me as a recurring whatever you know whatever it is i can i'm also doing voiceover auditions and i'm writing for tv and you know the bulk of my income at least comes from writing for television um but i'm doing everything i think in a way that god i mean in a in a weird way i wish i wasn't so did you ever expect that to happen did you did you feel years ago well, yeah. i'm going to be this that or the other i'm going to be all of it i think my yeah. first moment was like the first time i the first time I saw that you could make money writing comedy was when I interned at Conan in college. And that blew my mind, just blew my mind. Cause I was somewhat of a comedy nerd, but it really wasn't a thing in my head until I discovered Stella, you know, Showalter, Ian, Michael Ian Black and David Wayne performing underground shows in New York. You know, I was just on the cusp. I wasn't really around for like, Luna Lounge, I think it was called, or Losers Lounge. I'm, you know, these 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 early alt comedy shows. But I was there for Stella, um, and that really blew my blew my mind, like completely blew my mind. And that's how I f- sort of found my way into the scene. And uh, yeah, interning at Conan was like, oh fuck, this is real, and these guys are making money from from writing comedy, like. It blew my mind. And then I interned at SNL the, the year after that and just, you know, just couldn't believe it. Just just couldn't believe how, how, how cool it was. Um, so maybe I initially saw myself as an actor first, but I've always, you know, liked to perform in some capacity. And so I think it really just kind of con- the idea of what I could be congealed when I saw other people, you know, rising through the ranks by doing whatever they 
you know, wanted to do, whether it was act, whether it was do stand-up, write web series stuff, digital content, write for other shows, I just realized I can do that too. So that's sort of where I've landed. When you're acting on Broad City, do you have that sort of writer's instinct on, or are you open to sort of improvising when you're there and kind of adding to what... Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's definitely an improvisational, you know... I think when you're writing or acting on a small cable show, your budget is tight, you know, and so your schedule is pretty tight. I mean, I've also... that's I, I don't know if that's true, because I've worked on... New Girl as well, and you're also even with a big set and with a you know huge cast and huge crew, you're still trying to beat the clock and make sure you don't go a minute over lunch because then it'll be overtime. You know, it's a whole it's a whole thing. Yeah. Um, but I certainly do feel like yeah, on on smaller cable shows, there is a little bit more room to improvise depending on what the director wants. Mm-hmm. Um, and on Broad City, I think just because of the nature of the the familial nature of the set. And everybody knowing each other and coming from the same place. I mean, literally, you know, having the same genetic code as my sister, we, we, we inherently are like, yeah, let's improvise a little bit. But there's always a bottom line. There's always a hard out. There's always a lunch to be, you know, it's, yeah. it's um, fiscally, fiscally challenging to allow that much improv unless you're Larry David I guess yeah unless you're Larry David <laughs> well when it comes to your character on the show did you have any input in terms of what the tone of that would be in a way or um not really I mean um no I, I wasn't writing on the show when my character was introduced um and so since then you know he's a version of me that's kind of um a little bit more I think bitchy and um uh, uh, resistant and um, hot-headed than I am in real life. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's kind of... But that must be kind of fun to play with. It's sort of yeah. Sort alter ego. Of a little bit. I mean, it's still kind of unpleasant because then I feel like people might think that I'm more, you know, biting than I might be or like a little more edgy or hard-edged. Um, so... But it's fun to play with. It certainly is fun to play with. And I know that it comes from this sort of cartoonish version of how I acted when I was a little bit younger. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, as a, I'm, I'm more, I'm older now, so I'm a little bit more, you know, mature and, and know who I am more. And I think that version of me is like a version of me in my early 20s who was kind of, you know, bullheaded and, um, you know, um, kind of reluctant. Uh, but at the same time, the characters, you know, Abby and Alana are playing younger versions of themselves now. So I think it all lives in that space, you know, it lives in that space of where we were five, ten years ago. Yeah. It's always interesting on some of these shows, even Curb Your Enthusiasm, we are seeing, you know, real people play versions of themselves yeah. that aren't exactly what they yeah. are. I mean, look it's at, still a fictional... Uh, look at Susie. Set. I mean, people are like, people think Susie is this... Susie Essman, that yeah. she's this like real ball buster and like, you know, <laughs> take no, take no nonsense, you know, take no shit, totally no nonsense. And that is certainly a part of who she is as a person, but she's really sweet and really warm and maternal and kind. Um, and, uh, you know, well, that's I, like yeah. a credit to her as an actress. She totally can transform into something completely different from what she is. Yeah, or or just even if even if it's not in transforming, she's just adding nuance. That is that is uh, it's just it's it's great. It's a really solid amount of nuance that that differentiates real Susie from TV Susie and TV Bobby. Yeah. Now, working uh, in a writer's room, you've worked on uh, Younger for TV mm-hmm. Land, and yeah. now with New Girl. Mm-hmm. What is that experience like, kind of day to day, in terms of getting an episode script out there, and mm. how do you sort of contribute in the best possible way? It, ch- I mean, it's. I still can't believe that it's like a job because it changes from room to room. I was writing on the show Teachers for the last uh, few months. It's on TV Land. Um, so to go from, you know, Younger to Broad City to New Girl to Teachers, they're all different. Every room is, is very different and follows a very thin rubric. Um, 
which is a very strange kind of way of living to, to know that, yes, you're all going to one room for whatever it is, 12 weeks or 20, whatever, you know, whatever it might be yeah. with, you know, the goal of producing episodes of a television show. But really, it's up to the showrunner how the room operates. Um, and so it's completely subjective. And so for me, at least on a show like Younger, it's was and, and teachers, it's incredibly collaborative and um, smaller, you know, small rooms. And so it feels more personal, I think. Um, and the, you know, the, the way you the way you get from A to Z from like an idea to a full script is completely different room to room. So with, you know, a place like New Girl, it's I call it like comedy boot camp where it's, you know, we were I was there for season six, which was a full 22 episodes might have even been more than that. Um, And so that is it runs like a factory where we get there in the morning, you're divvied up into different pods throughout the course of the for every day you're with a group of writers and sometimes it changes sometimes it's similar to the day before um but ultimately you're all room by room by is room is everybody working on the same episode simultaneously or different episodes for each different episodes wow. i mean there's one author who's assigned their episode at a certain point there was i don't really know exactly what and when the point was that we were assigned that episode. And that's sort of the person to be credited as the writer. Of yes. The yeah. <clears throat> yes. And we'll write the script, but it's very collaborative. And yes, people are changing from day to day. In, you know, obviously if you're writing, you know, six, 12, which whatever, six, 12, um, for, for new girl, you're writing the script. So you're always in six, 12, but yeah. different people are coming in every day. Some people stay in the room for that week. Some people are rotated in and out. You bring a new person in, you know, on on Thursday, and it and it that point of view really helps provide, uh, you know, context and challenges that you might not have seen coming. And then, uh, yeah, and then at least on a show like New Girl, you then take everything and write write an outline, which is like almost like prose. It's a mix of like dialogue and prose. Um, and how so is it sort of like a scene by scene uh, <clears throat> breakdown within there? Or? Kind of, but you're really, really more writing it more like a novel or like a novella. Um, you know, single spaced, <laughs> <laughs> dense, dense, dense. Um, Even like internal monologue of yes. characters, what they're thinking, what they're feeling. Yeah, and, and external. So it's it's a real strange animal. You're writing it like you're writing a novel, but then, you know, throwing in, you know, yeah, Jess, Jess does so and so, or Jess thinks blah 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 blah. This is what happens, and then literally Jess colon quote blah 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 unquote. You know, joke unquote. So you're you're. It's a real hybrid of of um. It's a real hybrid of of dialogue and and prose or stage directions it's a really weird it's a really weird medium and how does that eventually translate into what will be the actual like physical script for production because, because you take that and then uh in a room like new girl you go back everybody reads it and you go back in and again i mean a new girl was like 18 of us and so everybody has read it and now it's now it's stage two we've all read it and so now let's break it down together, see what works, see what doesn't, do we need to change anything? And then once you've finalized the outline, then, oh my God, I'm already forgetting. Then I think <laughs> you, I, then I think that's, I think then that's when you go, I can't, for, I'm forgetting now. I'm actually forgetting the process. It's been a while, but I, but it's there. Not, it's such like a long, ex- it I is. I realize how extensive like each step is. Yeah, like no, yeah, yeah. Product yeah. Product it's, 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 you sort of, yeah, you sort of like, what's the term? Hurry up and wait. You know, you're yeah. getting that outline done and then it's like really unpacking it. And then I believe, and maybe I, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think from there, once you're good to go on the outline, you then have a week to write that script and you go off and do it, you know, you do it yourself. 
Um, Once it gets into the shooting process, or writers on the set tweaking things? Yeah, that's there. so far. It feels so far ahead <laughs> because you're writing that script over the course of a week, and then it is just... Once it's in, everyone reads it, and then you go and you break it down again. Yeah. And so I think at that point, you don't even rewrite it so much as you re rewrite it in a group. I think one, if I'm remembering correctly, and I might be wrong <laughs> <laughs> at this point because it's been a while, but I believe that, yeah, we would bring that script in, everybody would read it, and then you would sort of break down what works, what doesn't, what needs to be rewritten, and then that is, then you jump back into the collaborative day-to-day -day thing, where you're maybe heartbreaking a story again or rebreaking, um, and then it, you know, you're going through those channels, all the way to, you know, the script being ready to go, and, you know, yes, you're you're on at least on that show, you're on set for your episode, um, which is also a very, you know, fascinating place to be. And I was on set for my episodes of Younger, but all, even that was also interesting. I mean, it's just an interesting place to be because you have a certain level of authority, but then you also don't. But you also don't want to assert, I mean, for me at least, I'm only speaking for myself. You know, you don't want to... If he's on the set, there's the director, then there's the showrunner. Oh, runner, yeah. Showrunner's not usually on set. It's like the director, the DP, the whole, you know, the whole crew... Um, no, showrunners are, uh, at least yeah. uh, from what I've seen. You always wonder in television how much power the director has. In sort so of much power, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, yeah, they, they really do kind of lead the way um, aesthetically and in, you know, the actor, the acting, you know, that, that's really a, the director is, is ver very much at the forefront. And that's, again, just in my experience, but yeah, very much so. And then are you asked to sort of rewrite things like on the spot, like, hey, this joke isn't working. We need yeah. a joke in five minutes. Like, yes, but then like on a show like New Girl, because it's <laughs> such a, you know, big studio boot camp experience, you have five alts ready to go. Wow. And, and on New Girl, like what was most fun about that was like we did an insane amount of, of punch ups to... To, to, to get to those five alts. I mean, so, you, there are so many alts pitched that the documents are just, hu the scripts are humongous when they're filled with alts, humongous. Um, and then it's sort of the writer and the, two show, the three showrunners um, have the, 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 the final say in terms of what goes into the alt pack. Yeah. But yeah, you gotta, be, you gotta be ready, you know, it's, nothing is too, nothing is too much on the fly there. Do you feel like that you're a stronger writer from that experience since you have oh to my God. so much for, yeah. you know, similar situations oh, yeah. in a way? Yeah, it's crazy because as much, as much fun as it is, and it's so much fun, there's also this level of comedy math that has to be done. And so if you're rewriting stuff on the, on the spot, it can't, it, you know, it's not necessarily just like a nilly willy joke or like what's funny. It's like what mathematically works here, what, what rhythmically works here in terms of the comedy um, and what, you know, what would fit into the scene and not be jarring in terms of dialogue and throw off the rhythm of how things have already been going. So you have to already know how to do that and do so in the voice of the characters. Um, yeah. So when I think when you put it that way, there's not too much, you know, left to the imagination there's not, not not left to the imagination but but too much done on the fly you're in a you know in a, in, in a perfect world you're always prepared always prepared with literally five alts that hopefully the actors will do two of you know or three um and those five alts have been culled from so many <laughs> so many which was so fun i mean as a in terms of just like pitching jokes, those days were the most fun where you, for me, where I would just be in a room where we were just, I mean, these people, the people at New Girl were the funniest people I have ever met in my life. And the privilege of being in a room with them and pitching jokes, pitching alts all day for hours was like the greatest. I mean, truly so much fun. Again, like boot camp and, you know, mind numbing by a certain you know, part of the day, but what a fun exercise and what a fun way to use your brain. Yeah, just keep like figuring out like what would fit in this character, what would fit in the situation. Well, because the nature of that show in particular is so silly and absurd, it's 
at least it, it, it tickled, it, it, it sort of like lights up that part of my brain versus I think it would be much more challenging for someone like myself to do that at a late night show to come up with these, you know, to, to be hard pressed to come up with, you know, the, the late night monologue joke on the fly. I think something like New Girl is easier for me because I love the humor of dialogue. I love the humor of rhythm, of the way people speak. And th- that to me just comes much more naturally than, than the set them up and the punchline. And before you joined the show as practice or sort of to help you, did you write sort of like your own like new girl spec to sort of get you in that mindset at all? Or No, it's weird. It's kind of been, it's just, that was kind of, without knowing it, it was like, though, this is where I'm meant to be. Yeah. I just, it just worked. It just worked. You know, and, and I think that really, that, that skill, quite honestly, came from making my own stuff, finding my own voice, and knowing where I thrived. And it was in that sort of, you know, wacky dialogue space. And you can see that, and it gets betterish, and you could see, I mean, even in, in Broad City, and the way, that, the way that people speak, and the sort of gibberish terms or or you know like like colloquialisms of the show really and truly resonate with people in a way that a big joke might not or i'm or in just in terms of it's sort of like within its own language within its its own world in a way yeah it's like when a tv show has has phrases that in my opinion you know again from what i've seen when that tv show has phrases that end up on like cross stitching on Etsy or buttons or, you know, or, or hats. It's like, okay, yeah, people, people, people are responding to the, that language. They're responding to language. And, and that is so much more fun for me than, um, a set um, a setup and a punchline. And, and, you know, again, it's like, I don't see setups and punchlines from monologues on t-shirts. I see, new sayings, hybrids of words, you know, um, uh, little like mini monologues or, you know, I remember yeah. when, um, there was a, there was a, an episode of Curb where somebody called Larry's character a social assassin, oh, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that I was like, became a whole, you know. It's brilliant. Whole, I mean, it's, yeah. it's brilliant. <laughs> and I remember being like, oh my God, there's a, sh- there needs, there, and there were shirts and hats. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's the fun. That is so much fun to like create words or language or phrases that people respond to so much that they invite it into their lives on like apparel or something, you know, I love that. (laughs) And that for me again is so much easier to do on a show like new girl than it is, um, like younger. Yeah. But it is difficult. Like on those late night shows to, so oh my a god! Joke with a punchline, it has to be a current event. Oh, I, I I don't know if I have that skill set, and I'm so deeply impressed by people who do. Really, deeply and truly, I'm so impressed by that, um, because to me, it, it's a part of it's it's a part of my brain like that even like doesn't, a weekend update on SNL. Forget it. <clears throat> it's cr- I mean, honestly, it's like that's a different that's a different animal to me. I mean, I even I tried. I've tried to do like regular stand up, but I just don't thrive trying to follow that rubric. Um, and more so, I'm blown away when people play with that rubric. Like, Tignataro blows my mind whenever I see her because she is just, she's manipulating stand up and, and sort of bending it and folding it and tying knots in it that, in a way that blows my mind, you know? Um, if, even there's this comedian Judy, Judy Gold. She, she's in New York. Oh, she's great too. She's great, and I think people might, you know, see her sometimes as like a, a, a vet, an old, you know, a little bit more old school because she's a little bit older. But when I watch her perform or listen to her material, she is she's following the rubric of stand up in that she's there. There are, there are setups and punchlines, but she's also doing a you know, what appears like, and that's the magic of it, a diarrhea of the mouth thing where she's just talking and talking and reacting and reacting and talking and reacting. And in that way, she's, she is sort of subversively weaving you in and weaving things in and out and playing with syntax a little and playing with context. Um, and that also just kind of like blows my mind because 
you know, anybody might look at her and be like, oh my God, she's standing on stage screaming and she's so funny and she's really angry. But more so than that, she's like talking about real things in a way that, yes, she's challenging you to keep up with her, but at the same time, she might be disguising language a little bit or shading it or um, adding context that you might not have seen coming. And that to me is just, when, when a stand-up does that, I'm so blown away that, I rem- that I'm reminded that that's not something I could do because I've tried it. And so for me, you know, my stand-up is based in music. So I do, I do a live show here in L.A., in New York, every few months or so. I started in New York in 2014. And so I do it here and there and at festivals. And then I'll do... Do you have another <clears throat> performance coming up? Or? We're figuring out the date. It looks like it's going to be in March in New York and April in L.A., um, so not positive yet, but lining up those dates. But anyway, the, the show is, is, uh, it, it's, it's sort of, I figured out that it's like the best way that I could be on stage. It's my, it's the closest thing I could do to stand up without it being stand up. Um, and basically it's me, you know, singing melodramatic rearranged versions of really shitty pop songs and, and prefacing it with uh, a sort of you know, uh, over intellectual or, or blow, you know, blowhard intellectuals version of liner notes and musicology, like a, like a dumb musicologist talking about Katy Perry, but like rapping in politics and, and you know, the, the social climate and um, privilege and gender, you know, just trying to sound bombastic or, try, or being stupidly bombastic about music, but then singing a, singing a version of it that is different that is operatic and that kind of catches you off guard and makes you think something like i've never actually listened to the lyrics they're so stupid or (laughs) why is this song making me weepy or like how am i being touched by a song by smash mouth or wham you know just sort of playing with that medium like when you don't realize the specific language of the lyrics at all like you just let the you never heard them you never heard them yeah like we do what's a song that had that happens with Oh, <clears throat> for me, I, I think, um, you know, one song that people constantly are like, what? I've never, like, I know the lyrics, but I never actually stopped to think about them is um, Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne. You know, it's basically Romeo and Juliet, but, like, in the early 2000s with, like, a punk, you know, punk pop kid or whatever. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's just, it's pretty insipid. And then when you stop and hear the lyrics... You're like, how, how did that even, how is that on, how is that it? How is that the final copy? And that happens with a bunch of songs that, that I sing because I think it's really funny to not, all I'm doing is, all I'm doing is shading the song. I'm just recontextualizing it to sound different. I'm not hitting you over the head with it. And I'm not necessarily saying, this is like this, or can you believe this and this and this? I'm just letting the song live and breathe and then remind you that you know that you can't believe you know this song by heart but you never realize that it that it's about this yeah. that the words mean this that's so dumb that's so silly how did how do i how did i know the words for this song but not have any idea that the song is about such and such what is the name of your show uh it's called haunting renditions and so i started it as a web series in 2014 with my friend seth who i grew up with and he, he works on um everything I do, basically. We collaborate really well and have since middle school. <laughs> uh, and he works at Jimmy Fallon. Um, and so it was a really a passion project of mine, um, a vanity project, quite honestly, where I wanted to recreate a sort of smoky, MTV unplugged Austin City Limits thing, you know, aesthetic, um, but with recalibrated, rearranged, ridiculously melodramatic versions of silly songs. And so... We we shot it at this uh, art space in New York called Dixon Place. We had uh, my friend Mike Fram, who is a uh, middle school, uh, sorry, a high school principal, but was also but it was initially a music teacher and was the musical director of our improv group in college. He and I arranged these songs together um, and shot I think six of them. We did a Destiny's Child song, Bugaboo. Avril Lavigne's Skater Boy, California Girls by Katy Perry, a song by LaBouche, um, and Paula Abdul, an MC Scat Cat. <laughs> and, uh, and then I forget there's one more, but we shot it with a full band. We had a full band play it. We recorded it, and then we shot it that way. Um, 
sort of crammed it all into one day. I mean, to the last fucking minute. And I had to rush across town to do the monologue at ASCAT that night. And so we were just shooting this crazy web series to the last, I mean, literally to the last minute of the day. Um, but with that being said, it was just sort of our own little cult vanity, not cult, our own little vanity project that fo- found this little cult following. But then I turned it into a live show. And then from there, it just, the audience just kept, we started at a little venue in New York called Union Hall. And we just, it kept growing and growing. So we moved it up to a little bit of bigger venue and then have continued to bring it to, you know, bigger venues in both cities. Um, but I've done it at South by Southwest, and I've done it at Sketchfest, and um, and then I'll do the same thing at other people's shows, which means it has to be a place that has a sound system, so that I can't I'm not just I can't just go to a show and just do regular stand up again. Like that to me is not something I could thrive at. So this yeah. is what I'm all I'm saying is this is this my sort of version. Translates into your version yes. of what stand up could be. This is where I feel comfortable on stage doing because I trained I initially went to school for opera, so I'm I'm you know very musical. And so this was the best way to do that without doing straight up stand up or quite honestly not I I never wanted to do the kind of goofy tongue in cheek silly songs or parody songs. It just doesn't do anything for me and I don't think it I feel like it sort of knocks the wind out of the audience immediately because you know the joke immediately. Whereas this gives a little bit more of a build and it, it sort of it's a little bit more avant garde and challenges you a little bit. And you know, my favorite response whenever I do the show or I do a version of the show or a song here and there is when somebody says, "I wasn't sure whether to laugh or not." <laughs> That's my favorite thing, and and I've had to learn to deal with that because initially I've also felt like, "Are people? Do people think this is funny?" And I'll have, I'll ask friends like, "Were people laughing?" And I still remember to this day. I was like, I asked uh, Kate Berlant at one of my shows, like, "I feel like nobody's laughing," and she's like, "No, they're watch. They're just watching in awe because it's weird." And I was like, oh, well, that's great. That's great. I'll take that. I like that. It's almost like uh, Andy Kaufman, what he did in a way. I mean, I f- I'd flatter myself uh, to, yeah, to, to compare myself to that. But yeah, that's, tri- that's what I'm, you know, like I think of people like Caperland or John Early or Reggie Watts, you know, um, even like Zach Galifianakis, you know, people who go on stage and confuse you with comedy. That's, that's my bread and butter. That's my favorite place to be. And that's why I sort of speak so highly of Tig. I think Tig is a, an amazing stand-up, but she also is can be confusing in where she brings the material and how she repackages it. Yeah, I love that. And even in her show, it's so honest. The uh, the show she does for Amazon, one Mississippi. Oh my God! Yeah, excellent, excellent work. But like, I, I like she did a bit, and maybe continues to do this bit, where at the end of her stand-up shows or live shows or recordings or whatever. I mean, this is just from one stand-up show she did at the Ace. At the end of the show, she um, uh, surprised the audience with um, the Indigo Girls coming out and really built up to that and then gave away that she just made that all, that made it all up. <laughs> but then she reneged on that and said, I'm just kidding, they're actually here. And then she reneged on that and, that. and it went on absurdly long. And I think I speak for everyone and we were like, wait, are they actually here? Like we didn't, even after like she did it many, many, many times, I think people were complete. I know I was completely like, maybe they're here. Like, I don't know where this joke ends. And this was also at a point where she had been on stage topless for a ha- good half of the show. Topless, you know? I mean, I, and, and she has, she had a double mastectomy from breast cancer uh, she, so she's walking. I mean, this is a woman walking around topless at post mastectomy. I mean, it was crazy. Like, what a wild scene to be set. What a wild, what a wild visual. And then for her to be doing that, and then doing this bizarre, you know, like, uh, you know, continuous until it's abs- like absurd until it's not absurd anymore, and then it's absurd again. Bit with the, the Indigo Girls was like. Wow, what am I watching? This is so evolved. It's so challenging. Yeah. So it's interesting to see with comedians where they can extend that line between what's real and what's sort of fictionally part of the act. Yeah, I mean Reggie, you know Reggie Watts. Like he goes on stage with that little machine, a little box. I don't even know what you call a loop machine or something, and just goes on stage and 
he, there's a formula to what he's doing where he's basically like speaking, then doing, uh, he's looping and doing a musical bit. Speaking, then looping. Doing, and so it's, it's, the structure is not that complex, but when you watch what he's doing, he is like, I've always thought that he does this thing where he kind of, you know, satirizes language and, and um, not semantics. Is it semantics or, or, or semiotics? I think that's the right word. But he's satirizing language in the bits that he does. And again, I can't even explain it. But he's, yeah. he's sort of a, a satirist of language and how we speak and, and like how people sound and what it sounds like, for, what language sounds like in different spaces and countries and I don't know I don't really know how to describe it but I love how it's always challenging and always it's always weird yeah, it's I always weird kind of evolved out of the standard stand-up comedy sort of I don't know way. I don't know I mean it's so it, I, I honestly don't know I always ask myself like am I in a world where that's the where we have evolved out of it or am I in a pocket where even you know like what's real club comedy? You know, I don't know. I, I at this point I'm like, what is real? Because I've never done a show at the Improv or actually, actually I have done a show, but like like the Laugh Factory or or the Comedy Cellar. Like I have never done shows there, but you know, Chris Rock does shows. You know, these these you know um, titans of the industry. They don't. Th- you know, Jerry Seinfeld. You know, um, Amy Schumer. Chris Rock, you know, these people are doing shows at clubs, Caroline's in, in New York or the Comedy Cellar. I don't know. It's very hard for me to sort of calibrate where everything is because I'm so in it that I just don't know. I don't know if we've if, if alt comedy is mainstream or I, I just don't know, even though I feel like as somebody who's been, you know, who is a fan of Wet Hot American Summer from the moment it came out, I was like. What, like I was always, I was uh, in the end of high school, and so as a freshman at NYU, seeing this quiet, slow build of you know a cult fandom for Wet Hot was really, really weird because I distinctly remember going to a late night screening of Wet Hot, and Janine Garofalo came, and Michael Showalter came. I think honestly, I think Bradley Cooper came, and it was at a theater in like midtown and people showed up in some in costume but it was not a big crowd yeah and that but, movie really didn't have its success until later it kind of caught it on didn't and, right yeah. but i watched that happen f- fearfully knowing that like oh my god if this catches on then people are going to have access to the language that i thought was belonged to me my friends and me an absurdist comedy language you know little did i realize that was happening you know in new york and in la at these like alt in the alt scene, but I was still young enough to be like, oh my God, if this movie catches on, it's going to sort of trickle down to the masses. And I think it has. Yeah. Not I just because. It's be- had an influence on every everything that's come out since then. Every, yeah. every last thing. And the full circle is bizarre because I wrote um, a character on Younger that was eventually played by David Wayne. And I wrote a character <laughs> on Teachers that is also being played by David Wayne. Very weird, very surreal, very weird. It's just so weird across the board. You know, and I know Janine now, you know, from Broad City, and she's done my show. It's just a very bizarre place to be where I'm like, I can't believe I'm writing characters that are being played by David Wayne because of Wet Hot American Summer. But does the world know? You know, does the world know of that? Do main do most people know of the influence of Wet Hot? I don't think so. Yeah. Well, hopefully now with Netflix, it, it's kind of caught on a lot more than but it e- was. But yeah. even if it did, like, I don't know if if like cultural anthropologists would know <laughs> that that movie has had such a bizarre and absurdist sense of humor that, in my opinion, people globbed onto, knowing that that would give them access to like a smarter group of people are being thought of in a smarter in a smarter way or a little bit of an upper echelon intellectually and comedically and that has bled into everything into tv shows that like modern family is the sort of bastardized version of a christopher guest movie and and i'm not saying it's bad it's definitely not a bad show at all but it's that's a mainstream version of something that i think was a seedling from 
probably wet hot or a guff or waiting for Guffman or something. A hundred percent. Even yeah. uh, 30 rock probably had some of course. influence on a hundred percent. You know, maybe people who weren't, I don't know if the term is joke savvy, but I feel like when people could have access to Tina Fey saying, I want to go to there, you know, or to making to like gif worthy meme worthy quotes. Yeah. I think that's when everything changed. And people were like, oh, I'm a comedian now. Or <laughs> I'm com- comedically evolved. And I think Twitter has all, Twitter and Instagram have also helped flourish that too. You know, where everybody thinks they're really funny because they can say, I want to go to there. Or when people say, uh, 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 why can't, this is why we can't have nice things. Or I have all of the feelings. You know, it's like, these stupid turns of phrase that I think have given people access to the idea that they're like comedically involved. So it's a mind fuck for somebody like me who's a comedian and a comedy writer. And I think anybody in the scene would be like, yeah, it's, it's strange. Yeah, this thing is sort of unconsciously bled into, you know, people, how they react on social media. And what yeah, I mean, I don't, that do. sense of humor wasn't, yeah. I don't know if that was present in the 90s or maybe in the 90s but in the 80s i don't think so i think in the 90s i I think in the 90s like sarcasm found its place you know i think with chandler bing or whatever or like seinfeld or something that was when it was like oh if i can speak sarcastically then that's where i'm if i can speak with this rhythm then that's where that means I'm funny because I can access that. It seems like once a lot of the half-hour comedies left the whole sort of yes. multi-cam yes. laugh track thing, then it really transitions. I think so. Way. I yeah. mean, I think people watch the watched The Office, and The Office is a great show. But I think people watch The Office, and that gave them access to the idea of like comedy is in the small moments, comedy is in the quiet, comedy is in the awkward pauses. I mean, I. Everybody, you know, when people started saying awkward, I was like, whoa, you know, like <laughs> when that translates into like commercials, people, kids saying awkward or kids saying random or so random, it just, everything's different. It's changed. People, tr- quite honestly, people saying, I am all of the things or I have all of the feelings. It's like this pseudo juvenile internet way of talking that I think people think elevates them in a certain way. Yeah. And uh, lastly, I was just curious, where can everybody learn about the show once, you know, you guys announce the dates? Oh, Haunting Renditions? Yeah. Uh, you can find them on hauntingrenditions.com. Um, and then I always, almost always post them on, I always do post them on social media. And so I'm just at Elliot Glazer on Instagram um, and Twitter. Um, there's a Facebook page for Haunting Renditions and, uh, and as well as myself. So I think we have two separate pages, but we make it as public as we can as soon as we find out. So it should be fun. I mean, we always, we always have some really fun guests. Um, my sister did it in New York. We do a holiday sort of annual spectacular that we do um, in, around Christmas. But Judy Gold has done the show and uh, Gilbert Gottfried. And oh, wow. yeah, uh, then some musicians too had like, Ed Drost from Grizzly Bear and Harmar Superstar and a couple of the drag queens from Drag Race who are really funny have done the show. And uh, it's eclectic. I mean, because it's music based and has a little bit of that nostalgic element to it, there's a lot, of, there's a lot to talk about. And it's a, it opens us up to a wide range of what kind of guests we can have. Yeah. And it's also sort of never end. There's so many songs you guys can We have, yeah, everybody. the library just continues <laughs> to grow. And at this point, we're almost at 25 songs, which is insane. Insane. Who, who you know, it's like, you can't believe you've <laughs> poured so much time into like deconstructing a Smash Mouth song, but people like it. And, and it's, it still is just so much fun for me that it's my favorite thing to do. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. Thank you uh, for coming out today. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Road to Cinema podcast. We'll see you next time.